Well, I'm Paul Buller. I've been the current county commissioner for now uh, eight years, and I am married 20 years to my wife Renee. We have three kids, um, ages 14, 11, and 6, and they all currently attend Heartland Community Schools. I was a graduate of Bradshaw Public Schools, and then about 10 years after I graduated is when Heartland Bradshaw merged. So thus, I lived where I grew up, and my kids now attend um, Heartland. Uh, the, I'm actually closer to the city limits of York, and I live in District 1 by basically one mile. And currently, I cover four townships um, in York area here, um, Hayes, McFadden, Leroy, and Baker, and then the city limits of York is basically the site, uh, 4th Street out here on the south side, it angles up here towards the courthouse, or goes towards the courthouse and then angles off towards, I think, believe it's South Iowa Avenue where the old waste treatment plant is. Um, being county commissioner is a, uh, a learning curve. You learn a lot to listen to everybody, you get their opinions, and um, you also try and do your homework and base off some facts that may or may not be legal, and you try and do all the homework you can before you actually do a vote. And me personally, if I need to do more research or ask more questions on a subject, I will do so, and I, I, I don't like voting just because it's expected of you to basically say yes all the time. I do not do that. I live a very humble lifestyle and I don't like spending money and I don't like coming over here and paying taxes just like everybody else. And to try and keep spending down as much as possible is basically my goal. People do appreciate when you do go door to door and talk to them and, they, and listen with them because I'm very, very open-minded and, and people visiting with me, because many times you make a quick run to Walmart might turn into an hour and a half. Or many a times you're on the street or at the clinic here in, um, in town or uh, go to the lumber yard or even people have called my wife when they see her at her job and say, hey, can you tell Paul to give me a call? We'd like a little bit of gravel or a little bit of road work done in front of our house. And thus I'll take that message or talk to him and then I then will relay to Harvey and I also, he's our current highway superintendent and I think he's been doing a wonderful job. Uh, we've had our disagreements and I've had disagreements with other commissioners but I'll tell you one thing, one of the commissioners gave me advice and I won't say who it is but he said when you come to a meeting and you have something that you're trying to represent, you may win or you may lose. And it is a democracy. You got five commissioners sitting up there, and three of you may agree, and two of you may not, or four to one, or however. But he says you do not let it bother you. Because if you let it bother you, it will, you will, it will dwell on you, and eventually you will not get along with your other commissioners. Currently, I think us commissioners, and I think Bill will attest to this, we get along very well, we do disagree, that's human nature, um, we get along with all the people in the courthouse that I'm aware of, um, but they are also their own offices. Um, they are responsible for their own, the sheriff's department for his, uh, the treasurer, the clerk, the assessor, they're all responsible for their own offices. I feel that currently we have been very good as far as stewards or being careful what, what or where we spend your money at, but we also got to always stay ahead of things. Maintenance is a huge thing and it's never ending. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. I'd, I'd kind of like to go another term. I do enjoy talking with people. Ask, him, ask my wife, she'll verify every one bit of that. And um, a lot of people just want to be heard. And that's what I planned on doing and I've always done that. Thanks.
Um, my name is Amy Capcho. Um, I am a, a longtime resident of York County, graduated high school, um, met my husband in high school, married him 22 years ago. We have two children, Allison and Jacob. Um, Allison's just getting ready to graduate from Northeast Community College in a couple weeks, so we'll have another graduation. Um, and our son is currently a junior at York Public Schools. I am uh, currently the um, one of the board members on the York Public School District, and um, so I sat the last three, just over three years in office um, there. Um, I enjoy spending a lot of time outside. Um, I also have uh, one of those jobs that's a lot of reading and a lot of research, so I do uh, spend a lot of time doing that. Um, my husband and I are uh, pretty solid as far as staying in York. As many of you know, he um, has a business here that uh, doesn't allow us to really leave a whole lot, so uh, we're definitely not going anywhere anytime soon. And we uh, enjoy our county, we enjoy the people that are in it, we enjoy getting together uh, with people, and we talk to people all over the place all of the time. So um, that's one of the reasons why I was interested in, in uh, taking this position because so many people do want to talk, and so, um, and I do enjoy that myself. Um, I run a community title company, I have several business partners, and um, that's about it in a nutshell. I'm uh, Stephen Post here. I grew up here in York as well, um, involved with, uh, helped my dad raise cattle, um, involved heavily in the ag industry as I've grown up. Uh, went to the University of Nebraska Lincoln, uh, where I graduated with a double major in finance and business management and a minor in political science. Uh, had the opportunity to work in the Nebraska legislature uh, while Senator Adams was there, um, as well as work in the Nebraska Treasurer's Office after graduation. Um, got the opportunity to move back home. I currently am a loan officer at Henderson State Bank here in New York, uh, dealing a lot with commercial and uh, agriculture customers. Uh, my wife, Monica, owns Canine Kennels here in town. Uh, we've got one daughter that's 18 months and another one on the way coming in July. So, uh, busy time, fun time, but uh, the reason I decided to run for county commissioner is I've always uh, been interested in serving, been interested in politics. Uh, I follow it quite a bit. Um, being a banker, you know, I look at a lot of financial statements every day. Um, I deal with my loan customers, my ag customers, and I see um, the impact that property taxes have on um, on their on their statements and their lives, and it's a it's a large dollar value. I wanted to do what I could to give back to help out, um, whether that's uh, through serving as a county commissioner or using that platform to work with the state, um, the governor's office, our senator uh, currently, Senator Coulterman, uh, and doing what we can do to try to lower the tax burden here locally. Um, Dealing with a lot of financial statements every day, I've had a chance to actually read the county budget. That's about 150 pages, very easy, light read if you guys are interested. But um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of revenue, a lot of expense numbers. It's just very detailed. Um, but there's a lot of miscellaneous stuff, a lot of unknowns that are in that budget that I just kind of have some questions on. Um, and as a commissioner, I'd like to kind of get to the bottom of that, try to um, improve efficiencies where I can find them to really help grow York County um, and to make this a better place for our families. My name is Bill Blomersberger. I was born right here in York and raised on a farm about three miles southeast of, ha of Hampton. I attended parochial school in Hampton for eight years and graduated from Hampton High School in 1961. Went on to Milford to uh, tech school and graduated in 63 in electronics technology. Bill, is this thing on? Yep. Is it on? Can you hear it fine? <laughs> Can you hear me? That better? Went on to, uh, went to Bedford and graduated electronics technology. I couldn't really find what I wanted at that time, so I, I moved to Lincoln and I traveled eastern Nebraska as a salesman for a major feed company. And uh, during that time, I joined the Nebraska National Guard. I went on to my basic training in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, 
and finished my advanced training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina in communication. I came home and uh, married the love of my life, my uh, uh, high school sweetheart, Frances Hendrickson, in 1966. I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. I couldn't find what I wanted in electronics. Uh, so I went to work at Hampton a little bit, but I did go on to Kansas City. I had my radio telephone uh, third class license when I graduated from Milford. Went and got my broadcast endorsement, and for about a year and a half, I got to be one of the pioneer radio announcers for KROA FM in Aurora. And I did that on a part-time basis, uh, evenings, weekends, and such. But then uh, I found a business in Henderson that was looking for somebody to repair TVs. I didn't know if that's really what I wanted to do, but I did. And I kind of enjoyed that. In 67, I formed my own business, Bill's Radio and TV. Stayed in that for about 13 years and sold that. And three of us went together and built Highway Trailer, incorporated out on the interstate there at the Henderson exit. I was a kid on the block, and one retired, then the other retired. Of course, you know, I had to keep buying them out. And uh, I finally ended up with it, and I, I sold that in 2008 to two of my employees. My wife taught school there at Henderson. That's the reason we went to Henderson in 1966, and she taught until 72. Took 10 years off and raised our daughter and went back to teaching and retired from teaching in 2002. Uh, got a daughter that graduated from Westland, went on to the UNL, got her master's and her doctorate. She now is a outreach director for ESU4 out of Auburn, Nebraska, with her office at the School of the Blind in Nebraska City. She's got one daughter, Mallory, a <coughs> granddaughter. Uh, she will be graduating from Lincoln East next year. Uh, what, what after, uh, during that whole time, I was, I was asked in 74 to be city clerk for Henderson, so I thought I'd give it a try. 26 years later, I finally quit. After 26 <laughs> budgets, I didn't know if I wanted to look at another number for, you know, property taxes. And so I, I quit. And I waited about 10 years. My wife had kind of indicated to me, she said, if you go back into politics, there's a chance that I might leave you. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about it for a few days when, when I saw that I had a chance to run for election. And I came home and I told her that I'm really going to miss her. <laughs> but I did. I went ahead and filed in 2010. I got elected in 2011. Uh, I had a great opponent, uh, Gene Bergen, who's been here for a number of years, and Gene was a good friend, and he still is to this day. And I completed my first term, ran again a second term, and uh, I'll tell you what, I really enjoyed it. I've had some fantastic people to work with, uh, good employees, and uh, I, I think we've got things going well with the county. Uh, I feel I have goals I want to complete yet, and that's why I want to run another term. That's where I'm at. Thank you. Now we'll start with the questions. <laughs> All right. So years ago, the commissioners did a bond issue in order to finance the replacement of fractured critical bridges in the county. Soon that debt will be paid off. So, do you think the county should do another bond issue to tackle more bridge replacements that need to take place? Mr. Bullock, we'll start with you. Yes, because when we did that bond, we, were able, we had approximately 24 bridges that had a rating of roughly 50% or less is what I believe. And I think currently, we, with that one single bond, we knocked out around 11 of them. And, I th and that's basically been within the, roughly the last three or four years. We've done, I don't know how many miles of overlay on asphalt. It's probably anywhere from seven and a half to 10 miles. And it's just, it works good. 
we try and budget for some things, you know, some maybe some of the smaller ones that don't need uh, huge dollar amounts, but I think we do even have one bridge, and if I remember right, um, it's probably pushing a million dollars, isn't it, Harvey? Just for one bridge. And it's just a quicker way to get rid of it, take care of it. If we sit around and wait for the federal government and the state to help us fund a lot of these, it just don't get done. So it's just my opinion, yes, it needs to be done as soon as the bond is paid off and we are able to uh, get a dollar amount with the bridges again. Um, and then uh, go ahead and pursue it just so we get things not knocked out because without roads and bridges, I mean, maintenance of them is constant. You just need to take care of it and get her done. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kopcha. Um, yes, I do believe that we need to, to do a new bond as soon as this one is over as well. Um, the bridges are uh, very important out in the county. There are a lot of county bridges that are um, in desperate need. Um, we have a lot of heavy trucks out on those roads. We have a lot of semis, farm implements getting bigger, not smaller. Um, and so if we don't maintain those things, they just get worse. So we're not being, we're not being good stewards, I think, to our taxpayers if we're not taking care of those things. Thank you. Mr. Costier. In principle, sorry, there we go. In principle, I know uh, Nebraska would pay as you have paid. There we go. Okay. All right. In principle, I know Nebraska is a pay as you go state. Um, you know, they've done that for a our road for infrastructure, um, but at the same time, I believe that bonding is a good tool to use, uh, to have in our toolbox to use as necessary. Um, the roads and bridges are definitely something as far as infrastructure that needs to be maintained um, in the current state that they're at, uh, with some of them still being fracture critical uh, and being issues looking at the uh, one and six year road plan. Um, an infrastructure plan. There's no reason our county shouldn't have a good working infrastructure. Um, I think the commissioners have done a good job getting that to where, where it is now. Um, and once the bond issue is up, I do believe that that will be a good decision to go ahead and use. But then also to keep an eye on maintenance going forward in the future. Um, you know, in the short term, sometimes it's easier to cut savings just to, uh, to keep a little bit lower on taxes. Um, but when that goes to deferring maintenance uh, where it needs to be done. That does uh, create long term <coughs> issues that uh, I think for now we can definitely solve with the bond issue. Thank you, Mr. Bonsberger. Yes, I remember when we did that bond issue was about uh, six years ago. We issued $6 million worth of bonds to do about, I think, whatever we said there, call eight or nine bridges at that time. 11 we ended up. 11, okay. And we did some overlays and a few things like that too. What was good at that time is the bond market was so attractive. We, we issued bonds for 1.39% interest over an eight year period. These will be paid off in two, 2020. So I definitely think that we need to go ahead and issue more uh, I think we need to issue more dollars worth of bonds. I think we need to go at least maybe $10 million this time because, like you did state, Paul, oh, we've got a couple bridges that are probably going to take a million dollars apiece. We've got the most fractural, critical bridges taken care of, but there are others that continue to deteriorate. We've got heavier ag traffic. Uh, it's just going to, we've got to keep our infrastructure good. And another thing good about bonds is they are exempt from the lid. It is something that we do not have to include in the general fund levy request. Uh, I think the bonds right now, with the valuation that we've got, we're, it's only costing about two cents per hundred dollars of valuation to pay off these bonds. Right now it's taking about $783,000 a year. We've got three years left. And definitely, I feel we should go ahead. I, I think interest rates are starting to creep up a little bit. 
but I think the bond market is going to continue to be attractive. Okay, the next question. <clears throat> Do you believe that there are ample security measures taken in the courthouse? Should more steps be taken to ensure safety, such as limiting public access to one entry point or installing a metal detector at the main entrance, etc.? And Ms. Kopcho, you can go first. Um, that's a, a, a question I find very interesting because um, we have a sheriff's department in that building. Um, I'm a title agent. I'm a registered abstractor. I'm not a I'm, I'm not a security person, so I definitely feel like those things need to be deferred to our sheriff, our lieutenant sheriff, who's doing a great job right now. They had no problem getting things taken care of at the courthouse when we did have an incident. Um, I think they've got a really good handle on it. If if they feel that there are things that need to be uh, put into the building, then by all means, those are things that we need to work at with with the sheriff's department. Thank you, Mr. Postier. Yeah, I'd have to agree. The uh, you know, as not a, as an ex security expert, uh, the sheriff department is definitely um, someone I would defer to uh, their judgment as well as the um, the security committee that works as the commissioners and anybody else uh, with with people of expertise in the field that will do a study um, and go with what their opinion is of that. Mr. Bonsberger. Yes, and uh, I know Paul you served on the Safety and Security Committee, and I know you met the other day after our board meeting. I don't know what you come up with at that point. But yes, I think we're going to need to really, that's one of my goals, is to take care of the security for the people, or the people in our courthouse and our general public. We have a metal detector now that has to be gone through when the people go to the courts. I see no problem moving that down to the front door, sealing up the south door to the courthouse, only using it for an exit, and using the north door as the single point of entry. It's, we've had two incidents now, and it's not if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. And I think we really have to seriously look at this. I know it's going to take more personnel because I, I, we've talked about this at board meetings. It's probably going to take two more deputies, additional deputies, to what we already have on staff to man this, this uh, part. I've also had some other ideas on my own that seal up both ends and go and make where that lobby area is in the middle, make a single point of entry at that point with steps and remodel a little bit. Maybe that's all wrong, that's just my idea, but that's the way I feel. Thank you, Mr. Bonsberger. Mr. Bullock. And yes, uh, as Mr. Bonsberger alluded to the fact, I am on the Safety and Security Committee with a number of other people. And there are things that we do discuss constantly. And some of those things cannot be made public just because of safety and security. Um, am I for doing a single entrance? I would rather not. But... It's just probably a matter of time before we're going to have to do something. And it's one of those things that's a touchy subject. You know, you lose a lot of uh, free will being able to go in and out and not have to be worried about everything. But it, I'm, it's just going to, it's going to happen at some point. And it's one of those things, life has changed. We all know it. It's just, it's going to happen. But I would also like to hear more from my people that I represent and what their opinion is on this uh, as far as doing the single entrance with the uh, metal detector or manned with a guard or um, like Mr. Bonsberger's suggestion, what they would think to that. So a lot, of, a lot of my decisions hinge on what the people tell me. But I also got to take into account the safety of everybody else in the courthouse. So 
So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowler. We'll now move on to our third question. We'll start with Mr. Postier. How do you feel about the usage of the inheritance tax fund to pay for ad additional expenditures and shortfalls the county sometimes faces? Uh, overall, I'm not in favor of having an inheritance tax fund. Um, but since we do have it, it's something the state has, I feel like that is something that we should use to help offset um, other expenses with our, within our county, uh, different budget items. Um, you know, the county of government aid to team, in my opinion, is not meant to just build up a giant savings account. Um, that's essentially taking money out of people that are in its pockets and putting it in the county, in this case, is uh, pockets sitting there. So. I think using using that inheritance tax for some large dollar items, whether it's uh, roads, infrastructure, um, some things like that, would be a would be a good way to um, to help alleviate um, some of the financial burden that uh, that taxpayers have to pay to, to fund the county. Mr. Bonsberger, I'm definitely for the inheritance tax. I think it's been a plus for York County. I think it's been a plus for the state of Nebraska. I remember a few years ago where Governor Heinemann <coughs> excuse me, tried to eliminate the inheritance tax. There's some counties in this state of Nebraska that don't have a very big tax base. Take for instance like Banner County, there's some of those out there they don't have the population and they use inheritance tax to supplement their general fund request. And I know ours, uh, right now we're sitting there with about four and a half million in the in the inheritance tax, but let me tell you some of the things that we're supporting out of that, and that's York County Development Corporation, the York Library, York Adopt the Pet, uh, I can go on and on. There's costs of uh, Blue Valley Community Action, Blue Valley Community, or Blue Valley Behavior. There's probably close to $200,000 that we support out of this inheritance tax that is not brought in by uh, property tax. <clears throat> it is generated by sale of estates. There's three categories uh, as far as the collection. Uh, if an estate is sold and goes to a direct descendant, that's 1%. If it goes to any family member, it increases to 13%. If it goes to somebody that's not a family member, uh, it, it goes to about 18 percent. We don't see much of that because 99 percent of our sales stay within the family. So I'm definitely pro inheritance tax because even, you know, a number of years ago when we had the bad snowstorm, that was before I was even on the board, there was an emergency fund that the roads department could buy some equipment. If there is a big catastrophe, it don't make any difference if you have a, a million or, or millions of dollars, it isn't to be enough. But okay, I'm good. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really bad snowstorm. There's a lot to talk about with that under. Mr. Buller. Like Mr. Bonberger said, the inheritance tax does fund a lot of these little projects around town like YCDC and everything. The other one you forgot to mention was Hope Crisis Center. The, they all come in and make certain little requests. Most of them, very, very rarely do they ever ask for an increase. But these are all little projects around town that the county in the past and currently has chosen to support. Now, we have used the inheritance tax in the past to mainly for the roads department again, um, just because of, I don't know, I call them short-term type liabilities that have happened that, you're un that you weren't really planning for type deal. Those are the type of t times um, that I would like to see it budgeted for and then repaid back um, to the fund. Now, we do have other things which I don't have an issue with. If it's something like a capital type improvement for the county, say it is that $1 million bridge um, that we need to do that, I don't have a problem with using it for that. Now, I will add that when we did start, the inheritance tax fund at the time was roughly 1.6 to 1.8 million. And as of the 20th, like Mr. Bonberger stated, we're up to around 4.5 million. And in the last couple of years, very, very little of it has been, I don't know what you want to call it, um, used to rob Peter to basically pay Paul. Um, 
and I don't mean that me and as in general, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but it is one of those things that happens. You know, we got a courthouse across the street that's almost in the same boat it was back when they tore the old one down. We've had to go through and, and you know, we replace air conditioning units and heating units on there and everything that are 35, 40 years old. And I don't have a problem with this if it's something that's like a capital improvement. But, you know, that's the end. Thank you, Ms. Capcho. I do not agree with um, a state or inheritance taxes. I business I work in, I see what it does to families. It, it actually is it's not a, a tax that, uh, it's, a, it's a double tax, and people work their whole lives to earn something, and then they die, and then everybody has to pay taxes all over on what they, what they earned over their life. That being said, however, we use it in the state of Nebraska, and um, it is being used to to fund things here in York County that we need funded. And so um, I am not uh, at all, um, have any problem at all with the way that the county commissioners are currently spending those funds. And I agree that it does need to go to more important projects. It needs to make a difference um, if we're gonna use it. So, and I believe that the projects that it supports make a difference. Thank you. Okay, for the next question, we'll start with Mr. Um, Baumsberger with this one. Um, with the current expansion of the courthouse pending, would you support further expansion into the future uh, to provide extra space for um, offices such as probation, veteran services, emergency management, CASA, and even the jail? What was your first part there again? Well, with the current expansion that we are doing right now, when this is completed, would you be interested in the theory of further expanding the courthouse I, I don't think so. for other purposes as well? No, I don't think so at this time. Uh, once we get this expansion project completed, I think we've pretty well uh, taken care of the needs that we have at this time. Uh, we still have an office available for CASA. Uh, uh, Gary has done very well uh, in the basement with emergency management. Workforce development is hardly there anymore. We've got space available there. Uh, I just don't see that we'll probably be looking down the road at any further expansion. And right now, uh, we want to work together with the city of, of York also as far as establishing a green space. And I know they've had to have a, a hearing on changing some of that. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're going to need anything more for any other entities. As far as probation, and that's been a, that's been a pain in, for me, uh, we're, we're renting the space right now. Uh, we're paying about $2,500 a month in rent and utilities. And I remember when I got on the board, we was paying about $9,000 for probation. Today we're paying about paying about $50,000. We've got to provide space for nine or 10 different uh, probation officers. And when we went over there and took a tour of the building, we was looking at purchasing it. Uh, I only saw one or two people in there even conducting anything. And I'm, I'm just not ready to provide any more space for probation than what we have right now in the office as far as child support or whatever else might be without some assistance from the legislature. The first year they give us some money for probation and they just go, went away since that time and no, we aren't going to do any expanding for an entity like that. That's my opinion. All right, Mr. Bullock. The expansion project that we have started with the city of York, um, and we're probably going to end up going through with it here, is the the budget or the cost of the the I don't know what you call it the the structure itself and the the nine one one stuff. That's pretty much, to my knowledge, we have everything budgeted for that, and then we will be sharing the cost of running the nine one one call center with the city. I believe it is 50-50 if I remember right. Um, so, and we, 
we're end up, we're going to end up. It's going to be specifically for the 911 part of the call center because that has to be more like a secure location. And we are going ahead and putting a basement underneath this, also for either more storage, and also because of the old footprint of the courthouse, we need to worry about that because of settling and everything else because of the foundations. Now, the county does have other buildings also, so whether we can stick probation in the courthouse here or we can stick them out by the fairgrounds or um, we may have to reconfigure a few people, maybe move a few offices, but to expand anymore, I don't foresee it in my time here or my future anyway. And, you know, it's hard to justify some things, but when, when you do something like this that's fair to everybody in York County as far as paying for this project, I have no problem with that. Um, just because it's a, it's a need. It's having two call units or centers, whatever you want to call them, it's just sometimes ends up being a mess. So that's why it's just as easy to have one call center, one location, and work together with the city. I am all for interlocal agreements. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bowler. This is kind of chill. Um, I think we probably better not upset the County of York by trying to do any major additions. There's still a lot of animosity about the whole building not being there anymore. So uh, I think we're good. Um, I'm sure that this expansion is going to more than handle the needs uh, that we have at this point in time. And everybody's got to be creative. Things get bigger sometimes. Uh, Sometimes uh, there are things that you don't foresee down the road, but um, but you know every everybody's got it to be able to adjust and find room, and uh, we do it with York Public Schools all the time. We'd love to build a new building; that would be great, but there, it's not feasible. So um, you just have to find ways that uh, work for everybody, and doesn't all have to be on the same footprint. It can be in other places. So. And Mr. Bogle post here. Yeah. Uh, I feel like with the current project going on, um, the commissioners, I'm assuming, have done their due diligence and planned ahead as looking at future needs, not just the current need of the 911 call center. Um, so I feel like in the immediate future, and hopefully for a decent number of years, there's not going to be any need for future expansion. Uh, we might be moving some offices around or reconfiguring what we do have available. Um, but also, you know, as a county, if we're hoping to grow, long term, you never know what needs might arise um, in 20, 30, 50 years from now. So, um, you know, at that point, if there is a need, you know, there's op obviously options to go up. Um, hopefully, I don't foresee anything ever taking out the green space. I like having that green space in downtown New York, um, but it's not a lot. So hopefully they don't expand any farther outward, but um, I think for the immediate future, and um, there shouldn't be any need to, to expand anymore. Could I make one comment on that? Well, <laughs> I'd like to do it. hear it. <laughs> Let's do it at the end. Let's do it at the you end. said something about going up. We just visited with the architects this week. Uh, Randy and I are on that committee, and we decided to go ahead and add. Uh, the engineer said, add three more inches of concrete to the footers, and you can go up another story. And that's what we're going to do. Just in case, you know, down the road, if something does come up, we have that option to go up. Does anyone else want to make another last <laughs> comment on that topic? Okay, to make it fair. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mr. Bowles, we'll start with you on this next question. Me? Yes. Yes. Would you support displaying the words in God we trust in the North County Courthouse? I got the good one now, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> and they're random. We're picking these, they're, just, they're in a pile, so. Uh, yes, I do. It's, it's part of our national motto. I don't have a problem with it. We have it on our money. We say it in the pledge. Um, I believe Congress and the Senate have both ratified it or certified it, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think Eisenhower may have been the first one, possibly, that that suggested it. So, bottom line, yes, I, I support it. Now, I will also say that the majority of people that I have talked to me about it 
have been in favor for it. I would say probably in the neighborhood of two to one. Um, but I haven't had huge numbers visit with me yet. I'm probably talking maybe about a dozen people at most. So it's kind of, as of now, is the consensus to go ahead and do it. Now, I know somebody local did not bring this topic up, um, but once she did, I mean, it is food for thought, I guess. Think about it. And, you know, we all like spending money. And if we're good enough to have it on there and we spend that money, I guess, you know, we probably should live by our national motto. So that's all for now. Thank you. Ms. Concha. Um, I guess I, uh, I have absolutely no problem with it, but I do think that we have a lot of other way more important things that we can be spending our time on. And uh, no, I, I think that there you could dig up all kinds of stuff all day long. Is that going to get us anywhere? I don't know that, that it is. Um, there again, we're going to spend some more money. We're going to talk about it. It gets tabled and tabled and tabled. Somebody just needs to make a decision. So we can move on from it and uh, tackle the next one that comes around. This is your post here. Yeah, we all, uh, you know, in this country, we have a firm foundation in faith. Um, whether that's Christian, whether that's uh, Muslim, there's lots of faith in this, uh, in this country. Um, I personally don't have any problem with having a God we trust on there. There's lots of different definitions of God that people have. Um, and I think we need to, to respect that. We have freedom of religion in this country. Um, and I think that, that but along, with the, along with my counterpart here, I do think that there's other issues, more important issues, that we do need to be addressing to take the time up. Um, there's a lot of talk that just kind of goes on, but sometimes the decision does just need to be made and move forward. And Mr. Bosberg. Yeah, I think this country was founded on freedom of religion. That's why people migrated to the U.S. And I definitely am in favor for putting this in the courthouse. Uh, the lady that presented it to us from Spencer, Nebraska, said she had been to 51 other uh, counties and they had all approved that. I, I don't have proof of that. But since we've been discussing it, I probably I counted this afternoon, I've probably had uh, 15 different people tell me to go ahead and do it. I've had numerous emails. I have had nobody say not to do it. And I guess, uh, we're, you know, we talked about it. And in last meeting, I said, let's put this thing back on the agenda and get it taken care of. You know, so, so it'll be back on the agenda the next meeting. And just for information, uh, in 1864, uh, In God We Trust was put on the two-cent piece. In 1956, it was put on all currency. In 2006, Congress declared it the national motto. And I think that's where we have to approach it from, that it's the national motto. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Cottrell, you'll be the first one to answer on this question. <clears throat> the county and the city are currently working together to create a new uh, consolidated emergency communication center. And do you feel that there are other collaborations that the two entities uh, could embark upon in the future as well? Um, I do. I, um, I find it extremely concerning that there's always, uh, everything takes a long time and it seems to be really difficult between the two entities. Um, it's taken a really long time to get to this point. Um, I, I think that that uh, it's, it's one of the most important things that should be happening is our city should be getting along with our, our county and uh, working together to, because we're all here to do the same thing, hopefully, is find a way to lower taxes, widen the tax base, uh, attract new uh, commerce to town, um, which in turn attracts more people, which in turn attracts more children, which in turn helps all of us and, and helps break down all of our taxes. So, um, I, we haven't always seen that um, in the group working and um, I, unfortunately um, it builds a lot of frustration and, and there's a lot of frustration in people when uh, we bring some of these things up. So, I. Uh, I hope that uh, we can get through this. We can certainly move on to the next thing, and hopefully the next thing won't take 10 years. Thank you. Mr. Poster? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, the uh, 911 call center, uh, when I first moved back to York, 
I was surprised that it wasn't together. I heard that it had been talked about for a long time, and I don't know why it took so long uh, to work together. Uh, I think there are definitely areas, whether it's the city of York um, and the county, that can work together. Um, I think interlocal stuff does have a good place in our society here. Um, or if it's working the county with McCool or uh, one of the other uh, communities in this county, I think we can work together to help benefit um, each area and find different projects and take them as they come one-on-one -on -one and analyze, is it the best thing for the county and for our constituents? Um, and if it is, let's see what we can do to make it move forward. Thank you. Mr. Bonsberger. Yeah, it takes a lot of time on these uh, uh, interlocal agreements, and I think we've made a lot of progress as far as working with the city of York and getting together with the 911 call center. Uh, and I think we've been very active as far as interlocal agreements with other things. Uh, we've got a VA uh, office interlocal agreement with Fillmore County. When they lost their VA officer, uh, Fillmore County came to us and said they'd sure like to work with us. And at this point, uh, our VA officer goes down there like one or two days a week. There is a gal that is down there, and, and they're paying us $20,000 a year at this time for uh, an interlocal agreement for us to share our VA officer with them. We have an interlocal agreement for our emergency manager, Gary Peterson. He's based out of Seward County, but we do share uh, equal salaries, benefits, and everything with Seward County as far as our emergency manager. And we've got another one that's coming uh, to light right now. We're working on an interlocal agreement. Uh, Judge Stecker, who is based out of uh, Seward, has asked for a secretary. And he would like to have one, uh, an office here in uh, York and also Seward and go, go with an interlocal agreement to financially support this secretary because of the workload that's been ever increasing. Chris knows what's going on with the courts. It's getting more and more, and I think this is something that probably will come to light in the next uh, 30, 60 days before the July 1 budget time. Thank you. I'm down to Mr. Bowler. It's been so long, I almost forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, We've pursued interlocal agreements like Bill stated in the past. Uh, we also, one that he'd forgotten to mention was, and it's been on the books 20 plus years already, uh, we share the city's ambulance service that they provide. We contribute to their um, operational budget. I believe, and Mr. Bonsberg correct me, I think it's around $225,000. $211,000. $211,000. Uh, $211, that we pay the city of York to help maintain our rural um, uh, ambulance service. We also contribute to the Henderson School or Henderson um, Town for their ambulance service also and I believe that's six thousand um, dollars. I'm always open to anything interlocal but it does take time to iron out all the details. You just can't jump into it at the next meeting and say yeah go ahead because one side may want one thing one side may want the other and by the time the lawyers both look at it from both sides there's it comes down to sometimes a little bit of one or two words that um, you have to agree upon just to make sure everything's okay. But I don't mind consolidating services, but we also got to remember there's Benedict, there's Bradshaw, there's Waco, there's McCool, there's Henderson. So when we consolidate some services and have budgets being contributed to from both sides, we also got to take those towns into consideration and we also got to take in all the farmers that live in between because they also help pay the county's budget by a very, very good sum. So they, we got to, it has to be a fair thing that everybody can get good use out of and a good justification of it. 911 center, yes, it's wonderful. Everybody uses it in the county. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bowler. We'll start with Mr. Postia here on this next question. 
In the past few fiscal years, there have been discussions about whether county employees should pay a portion of the premium costs for their health insurance. Do you think county employees should be required to pay in for their insurance premiums, or should the county continue to pay all of it for individual policies? I think the having that benefit for our county employees is a really good benefit right now. It helps us have some of the good employees that we do have currently. Um, but having read articles on it in the paper and kind of thinking through um, what I've heard about in the private sector and some different things, um, I don't see anything wrong necessarily with charging a small percentage of the premium to the employees. Uh, but when we were to do, if the county were to do that, I'd like to increase their pay proportionately, um, just so you know, say it goes up $100 um, a month, raise the pay $100 a month. So on a net basis, if they have nothing. Um, different in, in day one, but then as our healthcare, as we all know, healthcare costs have become exorbitant. They're continuing to grow um, as the county's costs go up. Um, the employees can see that that benefit that they have is also going up um, on a, essentially, you know, whether it's 10% or whatever. Um, that benefit's going up to them as well. Because I think a lot of times employees and people do forget how much the value of their healthcare is as part of their salary, if they were to just be paid that and have to find it in the private sector, there's a big chunk of that that um, is a benefit to the employees. So I think it'd be a way to just kind of visualize to people that, you know, the county does appreciate me because they're paying $30,000 for healthcare premiums on top of my salary. Mr. Bonsberger? I definitely feel that health insurance is a benefit, and I feel it needs to stay that way. I don't think that we should be hitting up our employees to contribute to that insurance at all. And like you said, uh, maybe they should pay a little bit and then we could raise their wages maybe to offset that. I guess I kind of disagree with some of that because I feel wages should be increased on a merit basis. And that's the way I feel. I think we need to pay that insurance premium for that employee. That's a tremendous benefit to them. Thank you, Mr. Bowler. <coughs> Health insurance <coughs> is one of the costs that the county has no control over, really. They tell us what they're going to charge, and sometimes we got to sit down and bite the bullet. Now, we have had instances in the past where we've had huge increases, but, you know, we're still trying to take care of the employees, okay? I don't have a problem as with starting to charge a small percentage of the, of the thing. I don't think it should be a whole lot, but if they contribute a little bit, they have a little bit more skin in the game. But I do think that all other avenues need to be exhausted first. And this is gotcha. Um, I, I also believe that the county employees should all be awarded that as part of their salary. It needs to be a it is, it is a benefit, but it is an overall part of their package. The package is the whole deal, and that's everything. Um, that being said, I don't. Uh, I, I know that there are ways to be creative. We've had to do that. Other, other counties have had to do those things. Um, I don't believe in self-funded insurance. I don't believe in the way that we are insuring our employees at this point in time. And I know that there are other ways out there that uh, um, we can do better. Um, we've had to make some really... Uh, big changes at the public schools as well so that we could find ways that we could save money but yet make sure everybody is still taken care of uh, the way they deserve to be taken care of. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, the next question. Is there a position in county government that currently doesn't exist now for York County that should in the future? Um, examples could be such as a county administrator or a human resource director. Do you think those types of positions are necessary in today's world? Mr. Bonsberg. As far as a uh, county administrator, no. I do not feel that, <coughs> excuse me, that that would be necessary. I think the way it's operating right now is very efficient. I don't think we need an administrator as such. As far as an HR person, we do, we do have an HR person now on staff as a part of, it's part of the deputy clerk's 
position. So, as far as any additional, no, I do not think we need any more. Thank you, Mr. Bowler. No to the administrator, like Mr. Bonnenberger said, we do have an HR person currently on staff and we have supplemented her salary to do the training, take the courses, manage some of the, the issues that come up at the employee type level. Um, York itself, the county, we're borderline kind of on the tipping point that we probably should have a full-time HR person but we found just in the interest of costs and, and savings and the gal, she is wonderful and does her job and is very knowledgeable about everything. We found it more beneficial just to supplement her and train her off a little bit to, to handle these kind of things. All right, Ms. Cacho. I do believe that we should hire an administrator. I think an administrator that uh, has knowledge of all of the departments and everything that needs to be handled that the commissioners handle on their own. I think the commissioner's uh, salary should go to pay towards that administrator. Um, because then we also need to turn around and we need to have the meetings at night when people can be there. We need an administrator talking to the group, talking, telling the commissioners where things are at, how things are going. And uh, we, need to, we need to make some changes. I mean, those are things I know that, that don't happen overnight, and that's not necessarily something that I could be in charge of doing. That it isn't going to happen that way, but I think that we need more uh, accountability within the group. I don't know that uh, we're getting our money's worth necessarily, um, and I think if we hired an administrator, I think that that would maybe help streamline some of these things, and maybe we wouldn't have things take so long and have to do so many years of homework on before we make decisions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Postier. As far as any additional positions, um, I guess I haven't really thought about any additional. I don't see a need. I feel like the county is being run, for the most part, fairly, fairly well right now. Um, speaking, I guess, specifically to the county administrator, um, I don't feel like it's a necessary, at this point, um, we elect our county commissioners to represent us. We expect them to study the issues, to do the homework, to, um, to do the work themselves rather than to pass it off on an administrator. Um, you know, that's the way we've got it set up. That's the way it works, and it's been working for the most part okay. Um, you know, does everybody do the best job? No, but there is, that's why we have elections every four years, because if that person isn't doing their homework, if they aren't studying the issues and informed opinions, um, you guys can vote them out. Thank you, Mr. Postier. We'll start with Mr. Bowler here on this next question. How do you feel about the quality of the county's roads? Do you feel more maintenance is needed? Quality of the county roads, in all honesty, it used to be Hamilton County. Back when I first was married, I took my wife cross county. And I told, I told her, I said, tell me exactly the mile you think we are when we get to York County. And she was from Boone County, and she picked it out to the exact mile. Okay? Now, in, in the last three years, I honestly have seen a huge improvement. Hamilton County now is on the opposite end of the spectrum, because I got farmers over there in western Hamilton County saying it used to be Hamilton's was great. Now all of a sudden, York's are looking pretty darn good. I just had a remark from a gentleman that lives down in by Exeter there just this last week. Drives Fillmore County, he drives York County. And he said the same thing. It used to be Fillmore County's was a little bit better than York County's, but he says, anymore. I think that York is starting to come around. You know, we've done, like I said, 11 bridges in almost like a three to four year period. Re resurfaced over seven and a half miles of, of uh, paved roads. We've hauled over 122,000 tons of rock or gravel in the last three years. We have a highway superintendent. You know, we butt issues on a few things. We don't see eye to eye, but I still get along with the gentleman. He, he thinks outside the box, in my opinion. We have private contractors, instead of using county trucks to just go get gravel and rock and bring it back, He's able to hire private um, truckers 
and haul almost twice the rock for half the money. That's a no-brainer. So, the, and the maintenance issue, we've added another road grader a little about a year ago, I do believe. So, it used to be every district was approximately 80 or 95, maybe to 105 miles, and now we're down to 85, 88. So, thank you, Mr. Buller. Scott Cho. Um, I've lived on a gravel road on either side, east or west, in York County uh, most of all my years of living in York County. There have been years where uh, we've had um, some issues, and I think that that's always going to be a struggle for us. We've, over the years, we've had a lot of really awesome uh, maintainer guys, and those guys have retired, and some of them aren't even with us anymore. And uh, they knew a lot of stuff, and we just have a little bit, maybe, that uh, we need to work on. Um, with, like anything else, it can always get better. Um, you know, I, I live on a gravel road here. I have a lot of gravel in, in, uh, in different places that I don't necessarily want to see gravel in. And I know that's just part of learning the job. And we actually have a newer guy on our road. Um, but you know one thing, and I, I know that there are things that come about when uh, harvest is going on. There's seed corn companies. Trucks can destroy a road in a matter of of a day and it can take a year to get that road back so I do think that there are things and and it may be where the county does need to start going to some of these guys uh, with bigger operations and uh, finding a way that we can um, work together to keep that road in better shape maybe in front of them thank you Mr. Lestier you know roads are always going to be an issue um, you know, there's always going to be ones that are doing okay. There's going to be roads that need improvement. Um, I think we do have some good guys on staff uh, directing them, uh, working to do that. I saw we're having some training coming up. I think is that tomorrow that the guys are going through. So I think some more training definitely on how to improve roads um, in areas that are, are having some trouble. Um, as we get start to get some more traffic uh, for different reasons with the softball complex, there's going to be some additional maintenance, maybe more spot areas that are going to have that higher traffic flow um, that we might need to touch up a little bit more often uh, would be a good thing. Um, another thing that I've thought of, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard uh, that some of the one of the road graders has a large magnet on it. Um, I don't know what the costs are on something like that, but I feel like if they don't all have them on there, all those large uh, road graders should have magnets on the back of them. So that way when, people, when they're driving out doing their work, they're just picking up the metal um, as they go, saves people driving uh, flat tires, you know, chunks of nails, chunks of metal in their tires, things like that. Um, small things like that that could really improve the roads, but it wouldn't cost an arm and a leg to, to do that. And Mr. Bonsberger. York County comprises of 576 square miles or 1,100 miles of roads. I think uh, we've done an excellent job as far as maintaining these roads. About a year ago, our uh, asset manager broke the districts, or the, the motor grader districts in the 12 equal districts. We're running 14 maintainers at this point. They're each running about, like you said, Paul, about 85 miles of roads that each one has to maintain. Hopefully they get over these about every two weeks. And I think we've improved a lot there. We've had uh, several theory schools uh, as far as motor operators, uh, motor grader operators, we do the theory first and then the state has helped us out with hands-on training and I think we're getting a lot done that way and I think we owe a lot to Harvey Kime for the, the time and, and the dedication he's put into training uh, our motor graders. Another thing that's big is the elements. We never know when it's, you know, we got rain, we got snow, we got freezing, we got thawing, uh, the elements are always against us, and that's just, just part of it. What, another thing that uh, has increased over the years is the egg traffic. The equipment has got bigger. Everybody's driving big semis, and I know they're all driving legal, but uh, you know, <laughs> the roads seem to be just mashing out a little bit more, and it just more, takes more time to maintain them. So. That's where we're at. Thank you. <clears throat> so
So do you think that there is one particular challenge? What is our greatest particular challenge facing York County at this time? And yes, let's have Doug here first. Well, obviously, same as every other place in the whole world, it's money. So we just have to uh, continue to work to find ways to um, help bring down taxes, and that's through economic development, that's through housing, that's through a lot of different places. And uh, um, we have to be willing to bend, and we have to be willing to make changes, and we have to be willing to work together, most importantly. Um, for all of our, our villages, all of our cities in, in York County, uh, because if we don't, we're going to keep losing people and we're going to keep losing population, and I don't think that's how anybody wants it to end up. So, Thank you. Mr. Postier. <clears throat> the biggest issue I see is definitely property taxes, uh, doing what we can. I know the budget for the county, their share of the property tax is roughly 15%, so it's not a large of the total dollar for most people's property taxes, but every little bit counts as far as efficiencies, improving things, working together um, with other entities to try to lower costs where we can, but also working with the state to try to get them to help fund these unfunded mandates that they do pass down, um, and if they're, you know, I'm sure they're gonna have some more in the future for us to, to have a voice uh, with the senator, um, representing York County to, to try to get those passed down, uh, whether it's trying to get some state funding for, for the schools to help lower that area, um, like I said, helping to try to, to get rid of some of these unfunded mandates that they do pass on. Um, I think having a voice locally will help help with that. Um, and then working together with all the communities, you know, it's not the city of York, it's not um, McCool, it's York County. We've, we've got a whole county here that we need to work together. We're one large community. Um, and I think we need to look at that as we continue to grow and attract people to this great area. Thank you. Mr. Mobsberger. Yeah, I think we've been very good stewards of the taxpayers' money. And I remember when I first got on, we were assessing about 30 cents per hundred dollars of valuation. And then the property, uh, land, land went up like 16% a year for a number of years. We were at 30 cents. We were able to adjust that down to 15. We cut that in half. And now property taxes are, or property sales are coming down a little bit. So I think our biggest challenge is how are we going to deal with that? Are we going to raise taxes, you know, in moderation to the, take care of the demands that we have <coughs> from the general public? And that's another thing. People are asking for more services, so we've got to be able to take care of that. We deal with more state mandates, like Steve said. Uh, we, we need some more help from our senators so that we get some uh, assistance with some of these programs, especially right now. I feel we need a lot of help with probation. You know, uh, just uh, we, our challenge is to be able to work with basically the same funds that we are working with plus whatever it takes for inflation. Thank you. And Mr. Buller. The, the biggest two things I guess that I always always stick in my mind, well I guess there's three I guess, the unfunded things that we're required to pay without really any say. Um, we're forced to give money to District 5 probation and we don't even have anybody that can sit on their board up there in Columbus. Um, health insurance, that seems to be just out of control period. Um, something has to change. I've tried talking with Adrian Smith. I've, I've, I've talked with others. It, it, they just don't seem to really care, it seems like, in my opinion. Um, and then the, the other thing would be just trying to stay ahead of the maintenance of the roads. The roads have always been my priority. You need good roads. You need them to be decent and serviceable for anybody and everybody that lives in York County and or especially all the farmers having to get to their fields and everything else. A few years ago, the theory was brought up about closing some roads and turning it back to the landowners. Well, a lot of us people, farmers, and the ones that live in the country, we kind of got spoiled having a road every square mile, roughly. And as long as people see 
that the money is being spent at wisely and substantial type projects. Most people don't have a problem with paying a few cents more, or one or two pennies here or there to help fund those projects, especially bridges and roads. So it's one of the, those are kind of my three areas, I guess I'd have to say that are the biggest priorities. So thanks. And that brings us to our very last question, which will also be our closing comments. And so he'll just lead you into that. <clears throat> so why do you feel you are the best candidate for county commissioner? Why are you running? And what do you hope to accomplish if elected? Scott Joe, we'll start with you. Well, um, I am running because I, I felt like um, we needed to make a change and I have um, just enough experience to uh, have made me um, feel like maybe I could have a seat at the table. Um, what was the whole question again? It was like too much. Yeah, there's three, there's three parts, so I know it's, there's a lot there. <laughs> why do you feel you're the best to kind of answer that? Uh, why are you running? And then what do you hope to accomplish if elected? Well, I hope to, to be the, the, the uh, best commissioner I can be to District 1 and the taxpayers of, and the voters of District 1. Um, I, I have a lot of... Um, a lot of ideas and a lot of people that I'm looking forward to working with if that is if that is the outcome and um, and I think that we can bring a stronger voice to the table for district one and, um, and that's basically what my plan is if I was be elected. Mr. Postier. As, uh, as I kind of said in my opening uh, being really the only candidate that uh, deals with financial statements and uh, looking deep into those every day um, I feel like I've got the experience to really analyze the, the county's budget and to do what I can to lower taxes there. Um, as far as why I guess I'm running, uh, the biggest reason that I got interested in politics was when I worked in the Nebraska legislature. I got a chance to watch uh, our senators debate topics, debate laws um, that affect our daily lives. Um, the one in particular that always I remember is the, uh, the signs you see on the interstate that say uh, speeding fines are doubled in speeding zones only when workers are present. I remember watching senators debate that topic back and forth and watching the governor sign it and then those signs start popping up everywhere. Um, and that kind of is what made it real for me that our elected officials really are there to represent us and they affect our daily lives. Um, I think a lot of times elected officials get in their chair, they start to just you know debate laws but they forget that those laws affect how people live their lives, how they run their businesses, how they um, interact with their families. And, um, sometimes I think that's, we just need to have that as a reminder for our elected officials at every governmental level, from local to federal, um, that those decisions impact us here locally. And I wanted to uh, be the best I can do um, and remembering that as I, as I go forward to serve as a county commissioner. Um, I'm not just in it to, uh, to try to you know, have a personal vendetta or anything. That I just want to do the best I can. And the way our commissioner districts are set up is you run where you live. Um, and I want to do what I can to be that. Uh, voice for my representatives. Mr. Bosworth. I think right now the reason I, I feel I'm probably the best candidate for this is due to my experience that I've had with with the city of Henderson and also the last eight years that I've had as a board commissioner. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, be chairman for three years in a row which was uh, definitely an experience. I enjoyed every minute of it. I, I had uh, super people that I worked with. And, and like we talked there before, Paul, that we don't always agree, but we agree to disagree. And I think that's, that's the best part of democracy, that we can come out of that meeting, and if we don't like what the other one did, and, and it passes in a majority, then we all support it. And that, that's just uh, the way it is. I, I think... Uh, being honest with your constituents. And I've tried to be honest with my constituents in District 1 or uh, District District 3 and with all the people of York County. When they call, I try and answer. Uh, sometimes I have to do a little research, but uh, I feel that's uh, just being honest gives me a good reason to be a good candidate for York County. And I've got
got some agenda items that I want to finish yet. I just feel I want to stay on. Oh, I enjoy what I'm doing. And, and the, the, there's basically four things I want to get done yet. And that's number one, I want to see that the call center is complete. I want to really work on courthouse security. I want to see that we issue bonds again for the roads department. And, and I also want to look ahead in 2020 is going to be the 150th year of York County and I think we definitely have to celebrate that and I think the county needs to be a leader in doing that. And Mr. Bull? I'm probably going to throw a lot of the same question into the same little speech so I won't break it down or anything like that but when I was dating my wife back in 96 quite often we'd go someplace like Norfolk somewhere and We'd be at Walmart or a shopping mall or something like that, and I'd start visiting with an individual sitting there, and she'd come over to me and, and ask, well, did you know him? I said, no, I just kind of liked to enjoy talking with him, and he enjoyed talking with me. And I've always been that way. I can go over to anybody and anybody, and I can strike up a conversation with them, and I like listening to their stories or their jokes, and I hope vice versa they like listening to mine. I have eight years experience going on this. County commissioner stuff is a learning experience all the time. The first person we ever interviewed, I made the mistake and asked, so are you married, have kids? Evidently you can't ask that anymore. <laughs> so I didn't do that. Well then the second one we ever interviewed uh, was our current Rose department. Had dinner with him after the interview. His wife had tagged along. And I says, well, I can't ask him this, but I, I can ask you, how long you've been married and how many kids do you have? <laughs> so it's one of those things, I, I just enjoy people. I just, I, I, I crave conversation. I, I like matching wits with people. Um, it's just one of those things that makes me who I am. Now, yes, I'm self-employed. I farm a little bit. I carpenter a little bit. And um, everything I do has a, a consequence. So I don't like spending money foolishly because everything that I have acquired, I've acquired by myself. I had no help. And do I have a lot? No. And that should end my conversation again. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you to everybody coming out. Thank you to, to you guys coming out as well. Thanks to uh, Young Professionals for uh, putting this on. Thanks again, everybody. Made it out tonight.